they bring confirmation that if you want to rise up to Jesus, to meet him in the air at the rapture, the, the recipe to get that done lies within you. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you for joining me. Remember this morning we're going to continue with our teaching from the testament of Solomon. And you know the Lord has revealed to all of us many secrets that were unearthed because we chose to look into this writing of Solomon. Listen, uh, beloved, this is uh, an intricate web of secrets um, that takes a special wisdom to understand. I'm not talking about me understanding it, but when you receive it. And so I pray that all God's children understand. This is a complicated matter to piece together so that I can give you in a manner in which you will be able to comprehend it and use it to better yourself so that you can stay away from the paths of unrighteousness. Keep your candle burning so that when that trumpet sounds you will rise up to join Christ in the air. One of the things that um, we ponder sometimes, it's natural, in what fashion will we go up to meet the Lord in the clouds? Let's take that as a basis for what I'm going to share with you this morning. The, the manner in which we all will be caught up. Um, what's the principle behind that action of rising to meet the Lord in the air? Let's first lay the foundation with one of the writings of the Apostle Paul from 1 Thessalonians. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Now, the Lord gives Solomon the recipe. I don't think he totally comprehended the recipe. But he's given Solomon a seal that we spoke about comprehensively in the last few weeks. That seal is the basis, the principle on which we will rise in the air to meet the Lord. The first thing I want to remind you of what we learned from the last few weeks is that Solomon was building God a temple and he encountered quite coincidentally a little boy who was working for him, the master craftsman's son, the master mason, his son, now, some might want to believe that the actual demon was present to eat the boy's food and to take half his money. But I want you to picture that when I encounter demons over my lifetime as a pastor, 
you encounter them as having possessed somebody. So they speak from the inside of a human being. They take over the body and they have a conversation with you. You know, many years ago, when I was still renting, I was a pastor but of Trinity International. I got a frantic call from one of my members. And this young man was close to us. And he phoned me and said, Pastor, my brother, who is also close to us, um, I think he's possessed. When I woke up from the bed, he is sitting up on the same bed. They were, you know, they were poor people living in a small room. He got up from his bed. He sat up and he's looking at me, but I can only see white in his eyes. I can't see the black. And so they gathered this young man up and they brought him to my place and he sat across me on a settee. He looked in my direction, but all I could see was the white of his eye. I mean, it was a frightening experience. It was one of the first times that I saw a possessed person not using the eyeball, the black of it, the pupil. This spirit was looking through the boy's eyes without using his pupil, just the white, and he's talking to me. Eventually, we, we spoke to that spirit, and it was actually a demon that had possessed him. I'm not going to go into the details of that, but that's something to consider when you think of this little boy that was working on the temple, a demon was troubling him. But it probably, in my experience now, came in the form of somebody in that household that was possessed by the demon. And so in that fashion, that human being that was living in that house possessed by this demon called Onias was tormenting that little child. And so that same person that was doing that embodied Onias. Solomon used that demon inside to make that demon inside that human being work in the temple and extracted secret information from these demons and how they operate. One of the ways in which uh, Solomon found to control these demons was a pentalpha ring that was given to Solomon by the archangel Michael. Using this ring, he was able to bind these demons so that they become slaves for Solomon, working to build God's temple as a mason, stone mason. We gave details about that. So I'm just reminding and refreshing you. And then this demon, Onias, which was the lowest ranking demon, was spilling some beans and he offered Solomon to entrap other demons, including Beelzebub, the prince of demons. And so many demons appeared before Solomon, probably inside human beings that were brought to Solomon one at a time. And Solomon spoke to these demons and used these people to build the temple. And so we're going to go through them a few at a time, depending on time. But this pentalpha ring that I spoke to you about, the secret of us rising to meet Jesus in the air is based on the principles that embodies the pentalpha ring. Now you'll remember we shared with you that when demons, uh, when human beings want to become Satan worshippers, in order to make satanic things manifest, demons from that world, they use that pentalpha, uh, the, the inverted pentalpha, and we know that as the pentagram. And so I want you to visualize this. In a spiritual manner, that I won't get into details right now, those, that five uh, 
structured uh, pen, pentalpha shape in the form of a star when you turn it for example clockwise it locks demons in that place now an inverted pentalpha is a pentagram and when they use a pentagram they turn the pent pentalpha the other way so that demons are released like a jar you close and you open and so that's the basis on which Solomon used to trap or bind these stone masons and I shared with you that when the temple was finished these human beings who were possessed by these demons transferred their spirits onto all the other masons and so these slave masons when the temple was finished they released themselves from the bondage and they became Freemasons no more bond masons no more slave masons they were Freemasons and they formed this organization I gave you all the details that you may need uh, last week in the week before and so they spread across the world even until this day and they influence um, all the the leaders of the world the secret society I told you about these people in a past sermon a while back where we showed you all the organizations headquarters in different places and all the business leaders that are secretly part of these organizations including political leaders they are all controlled by the decisions made by Freemasons now when Solomon engaged with Beelzebub the prince of demons Beelzebub told Solomon and I'm not going to read to you that part right now but he engaged with Solomon he said we will rule the world it was a prophetic message he said we will destroy the world you might have us in bondage now but there's gonna come a time when we're going to be released from this bondage and we're going to destroy this world Wow what a prophetic message Beelzebub gave to Solomon it's unfolding before our eyes as we speak now when you look at a Freemason ring it consists of a five-sided star they have their symbol but if you finish the lines on those symbols you'll find a five-sided star and in the middle is the word G which is a representation of the God that they serve now I'm going to give you that's why I'm saying to you this was an this is an intricate teaching it's not easy for me to put the pieces together but I want you to follow closely if you want a greater and deeper understanding of spiritual things the Pentalpha is based on the principle of the Makaba what is a Makaba we learned that in a previous message some time back but let me start with this in 2nd Kings chapter 2 verse 11 then it happened as they continued on and talked that suddenly a chariot of fire I want you to remember that term a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven whirlwind remember that a chariot of fire creates a whirlwind a spinning action that elevates Elijah into the heavens you remember Elisha and Elijah were walking together and this portion of scripture tells us in what manner Elisha was take Elijah was taken up into heaven a chariot of fire in Hebrew is called a Merkaba let us go into Ezekiel's vision now as I looked at the living creatures behold a wheel 
was on the earth beside each living creature with its four faces. The appearance of the wheels and their workings was like the color of beryl. And all four had the same likeness. The appearance of their workings was, as it were, a wheel in the middle of a wheel. Now we're talking about the appearance of a makaba, of a chariot of fire. It creates a whirlwind. And what is this makaba that is being referred to here? It's living. It's not an abstract or, or, or an object without life. It is, it is an animated uh, living creature. And we learned last week that when you have um, something made in the shape or form of a makaba, it is used to transport somebody from the material world, this world into the spirit world, and somebody from that world into this world. And the way in which a person rises up from this world and goes into the spirit world is through the spinning action of wheels creating a whirlwind, a spinning action that allows the being to rise in the air. That's the principle of the makaba. So you cannot enter into heavenly places or other spiritual areas or realms unless you have the makaba. Any form of makaba. You, 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 you can't enter from that side to this side unless there's a makaba. So in order for angels to come down, they have to use the angelic makaba. In order for man to go from here to there, a makaba has to be present. So whenever, whether it's Enoch or whether it's um, Elijah or whether it's Ezekiel that we read about, you, in Ezekiel you find that um, a makaba, a chariot of fire, a living being with wheels within a wheel, with a spinning action is required. For, it, for the transport of a person from one realm to the next. The makaba effect creates a portal, a transporting portal that opens up the, the, the way from one realm to the next. This makaba that is used by God now to come down, to go up, is the angel that surrounds his throne. Those angels are called orphanum. They look like a wheel within a wheel. Let's read the definition of ophanum. In Hebrew, it's wheels. There's alternative, alternate spellings and pronunciations. But in short, it's wheels, spheres, wheels again, and whirlwinds. You see, when Elijah went up to heaven... A, an orphanum appeared to create a whirlwind. That's what we read. So that Elijah can be transported up. Now the Pentalpha is a representation of the orphanum or the makaba. A spinning whirlwind. Remember the meaning of makaba is ma-ka-ba, light spirit body. The makaba we read last week is an interdimensional vehicle with counter rotating fields of energy or light, a wheel within a wheel. That's on the Freemasonic site. So remember now, the makaba, which is a representation of the orphanum, which is also represented by the pentalpha, is the spinning action like a whirlwind that transports spirits from one realm to the next. Now, when Jesus comes, <laughs> you're going to need a makaba. You cannot be transported from this world to go into the realm where he is, in the air to meet him, unless a makaba is present. 
this is so important people it it's the basis on which you will rise in the air now let me put it this way if your makaba is not in the correct whirlwind spinning position you will not go up and then people who remain behind will say how come we did everything jesus is here and we have not lifted off now the makaba operates in a way that you and me are able to activate it for us to be transported up in the air we also have the power to deactivate it and the devil wants us to continuously keep this makaba deactivated so that the spinning action in the right direction to release your spirit into that realm will not take place some people will be standing on the ground if this is something visible to the world they won't be lifting off even though they've been faithful this is why what i'm sharing now is of utmost importance now you remember i gave you an introduction to the vitruvian man the famous um teaching of leonardo da vinci now this man had contact with the spirit world through his makaba drawing this is a makaba drawing this epitomizes the star like structure a wheel within a wheel now if you look at a man's head his two hands and his two legs they form a five sided structure a star and that represents a makaba so a human being is naturally able to be transported from one realm to the next now if you spinning the wrong way you will in other words if you have an inverted makaba an inverted pentalpha you will lock yourself into the, a wrong spiritual realm if you spinning it the right way you will open yourself into the world where god is so your spinning action the movement of that pentalpha must not be a pentagram it has to be a pentalpha so i'm going to share with you stuff now pay very careful attention let's read some of the stuff we read to you last week within the study of quantum physics each dimension is separated by 90 degree rotation when you change wavelengths and rotate 90 degrees you will disappear from this world and reappear in whatever dimension you are tuned into the images that you see on this physical plane or third dimensional realm the man realm that we live in in other words would change according to the wavelength of the realm that you have entered our planet has many different worlds they are all right here but most of us are only viewing the maya or illusion illusory realm because the human conscience has been preconditioned to tune into one particular wavelength so these freemasons they know the secret the reason they know it is because they are possessed by these demons these demons know all these things now it seems very unfair if demons and demons children that living on this planet know these things that children of god are blind they don't know anything so here am i trying to give you what you need to understand things that spirits from the other side know more than you If you remember I taught you about Leonardo da Vinci's great insight he was a mathematician he was an architect he was a, a astronomer he was an astrologer he knew all he was gifted he was a painter now what I know I can't prove it because I can't even dig his body up but he was possessed this man 
There are times if you look at Leonardo's drawing, you'll find that there are times when his work is exquisite. His painting strokes, you know like how the Freemasons were gifted in creating uh, the temple, the exquisite structure, the excellence with which that temple was built. This man had the similar kind of excellence in his paintings. But there are other times, if you look at Leonardo's drawings, it's like that spirit left him for that small period of time and he was himself and he painted what even a five-year-old will, will be able to paint. But these, these people around the world, they sell his thing no matter what he painted. Even if my Sophie paints better than him, they won't take it, they'll take his. But he was not gifted as a human being is gifted. He was possessed. And that's why he had insight about future things. You know, I told you about his drawings. This man drew um, diagrams of the human body, of, of machinery that hasn't, haven't been invented, invented yet. He, listen to me, he created the principle of a whirlwind blade, a spinning action that will allow a vehicle like a helicopter to lift off the ground in the same manner the Pentalpha works. So his idea of lifting off the ground was the spinning action of blades on top of a vehicle. So this prediction of his before the first helicopter was made like 600 years later, the drawing came 600 years earlier about how man can sit in a vehicle and be lifted up in the air. So he had wisdom or knowledge behind, beyond his years. And the only way he could know this is if he knew the secret of the Pentalpha. If he was in contact or possessed by these demons from the other side. You know all these notes, all these drawings of his is collected in a codex form, a compilation of documents. And this codex was sold uh, at an auction and the person that bought that was none other than Bill Gates. The article tells us in Leonardo da Vinci's scientific notebook, The Mind of a Genius at Work, the codec now belongs to Microsoft co-founder and philanthropist Bill Gates, who bought it at an auction at Christie's in 1994 for 30.8 million. This man was trying to get closer to the other side so that he can extract information. Do you know this man was on his knees? I gave you a video very early on where he was sitting before an inquiry by the FBI for conspiracy, uh, for fraud. And he was shivering and shaking like he was a little boy. That video, and, and he, was, he was down and out until he bought this. And from that moment on, the information contained in Da Vinci's do Codex gave him impetus to rise to where he is today. So this is a, not a natural uh, action that rose this man. This man looks to be possessed or influenced by some dark forces that have a very evil agenda. Now you see what these people know, the Freemasons, and what this yoga thing is based on. And that's the same representation of the, of the lighting up of the energy that lives inside a human being. In other words, the spinning action of a spirit that will allow them to transcend realms to go into other dimensions. The secret is written in the Freemason website. Let's read some of that. The Makaba is an interdimensional vehicle with counter rotating fields of energy. There's it, the counter rotating fields of energy or light, wheel within a wheel and is housed, listen to this, at the base of the spine, along with the serpentine power known as Kundalini or K energy. Kundalini is that energy that is coiled there's the coil again, around the base of the spine like a snake and travels along the spinal cord in a winding whirlwind fashion through each of the chakras as one becomes more awake. You see, you can only become awake if you transcend into another world, another realm. And the way to do that, the secret is, lies within a human being. So, they bring confirmation that if you want to rise up to Jesus, 
to meet him in the air at the rapture, the, the recipe to get that done lies within you. You are a built-in makaba. Beloved, you are a walking, living, breathing makaba. Now, when you spin the makaba, let me remind you, when you spin the makaba one way, you lock a person in a realm. When you spin it the other way, remember the pentalpha locks, uh, the pentalpha opens to, a, to the one realm, the, the pentagram locks it into another realm. Now, that spinning action, the way to lock a spirit in one world is to turn their own inside built makaba. And the screw, picture a screw. If you're screwing it one way, you're locking it in. The devil wants to screw you that way so that you get locked in to this realm, to his realm, to his world. He wants to bind you. He wants to keep you from being unscrewed. So God's, if, if you are in God, if you want to be released into his realm, you have to learn how to unscrew. And when a person is totally unscrewed and the screw is sitting out now, it's not in, it's unscrewed, you find that you are now ready for liftoff. So at any given time, when Jesus comes, your spirit is not locked into this world. It is separated from this world. So that when he comes, you are not bound anymore. You're not locked into this world. You're not attached to this world. You are free from this world. But the devil wants you to get involved in this world. He wants to keep you tightened in. He wants you to worry about your house. He wants you to worry about who hit you, who spoke about you. He wants you to get involved more and more. And the more you get involved, the tighter your makaba screws you into this realm. And when Jesus comes, you're going to be standing here unable to release yourself. And, and you know, that's what happened when Jesus was baptized. When you get baptized and you repent from all your sins, you take all the kaka out from inside, all the dirt, all the bujis that you've been carrying, you've been wanting, you've been having enmity, you have unforgiveness, someone did something to you and you can't get past it. And, and because of that, it, I want you to see this picture. Because you can't let go of something someone did to you on this planet, in this world, whether they stole your mother's house, they stole your wedding ring, whether they robbed you for some business venture, you are engaged and you are screwed in. When you get baptized, you're supposed to let go of every enmity. Every unforgiveness. That's why unforgiveness is one of the main reasons people stay possessed. You locked into this world. And the spirit that is you are the spirits that easily access you because you're locking into their realm. They, they rule this earth. You're locking into this realm where they are. And so when you Practice unforgiveness, whatever it is, filth in your heart. Sometimes when you go to a function, somebody got something against you, they look at you funny. You know that heart might be a Christian, might be going to church, raising their hands, praying in tongues, and God knows what else these people do. But when they look at you, they look at you funny like you did something to them. They got something against you. That screwed them in. So, beloved, don't think that because you accept Jesus Christ as your savior, the devil works on you. From the time you give your life to Jesus, he works on you and he screws you more and more into this world. You become locked in. When the Jesus comes, my God, it's too late. That's why when you baptize yourself, every filth needs to be gone. When Jesus was baptized, his makaba was open. Holy Spirit came through, sat on him. And, and, and he was able, he can rise anytime. He can rise up, come out into the spirit world at any time. And, and he, he was able to do, uh, he, he was even able to go down to, 
to Hades because he died as a sinner, the sinner for all of us. He put the sin on himself so that when he screwed with sin, he went into that realm, he liberated everybody and because he died sinless, he was risen up to heaven. So his makaba was free. He was not in bondage. And so I want to encourage you this morning, knowing this principle, I want you to, you see, once you get baptized, maybe you let go of everything and then you come into the world the next day after you get baptized and slowly the devil locks you. He says, right, you screwed properly out. I'll show you. I'll bring things on your way. I'll make people do things to you that you won't forgive them for. I'll make people use you and then abuse you. I'll make people talk about you. I'll do all sorts of things just so that you can have it in for them. And so you get screwed in. You get screwed in. And then you find um, somebody gets a better job or you get a better job than somebody. And you find that they look at you funny now. They do things against you. And the, the devil is working on those people. And you know, when my job now is to get you ready to get you unscrewed from this world to turn whirlwind the other way so that you can every day you need to take and loosen yourself till you sit on that platform when Jesus comes you don't need any more unscrewing you can be released into that world now let us let us just go into the testimony of Solomon see because of time I can't give you everything at once because I have to break it down so that you can swallow it and understand it. Now if you're sitting there, there is something that is troubling you about your life situation right now. It means that you have not separated yourself from the things of this world. Which means that even at some level you screwed in. I want you to find a way so that you can ask God, Lord, you took care of the birds. You make the lilies grow. But Father, I'll do everything I need to do. I need you to do the rest for me. Set yourself free. Those who God set free are free indeed. <laughs> you're not screwed in. You're free. Indeed, you're free. That's what that scripture seeks to inform us about the whirlwind, often a macabre fashion of every human body. Let's look at Solomon now. Last two weeks I introduced you to Solomon speaking to two demons, Onias and Onoskelis, the female one. Now both of these demons represented the sign of the zodiac. Onias, for example, was a water pourer. That's an Aquarius star sign. In astrology, Aquarius is the 11th sign of the zodiac, considered as governing the period from about 20th January to about February the 18th. Now listen, <clears throat> if you are born within that period, for example, you fall within the domain. You know what's also interesting? I didn't write this down so that I can, be, but you know, I'm thinking, you know, when they created the sign, when Solomon heard, when uh, Onias told Solomon, I am the water pourer. That's what he told Solomon, I'm the water pourer. And you know astronomy, learning about the stars, astronomy I'm talking about, where they are positioned in space. You can't notice this with the normal naked eye. You can only position these stars in certain places when a binoculars or some, you know, Copernicus or these people invented that in later times, you know, 2,000 years afterwards, after Solomon had this conversation. So how did this demon know that the shape of that zodiac sign, the stars that were positioned in a way that looks like a water pourer pouring something out of a big jug? I mean, they only knew where the stars were positioned 2,000 years afterwards. At that time, they didn't know star positioning. So only a demon from that side could have told Solomon so that he could write it. Remember, Solomon's writings are 
2,000 years before these things were discovered in space. So this is amazing. If you're born within that period, this, this demon is in charge of people born on this planet during that period. Now, he is God of them. He proclaims himself to be in charge of those people born within those months. But he is only in charge of those who acknowledge the sign of the zodiac. So in other words, if you um, acknowledge, you look at your sign and say, you know, I'm, I'm that, I was born in that time. That's the type of person I am. And, and you and I are like, like we're born in the same time, we are the same star. If you acknowledge that, that's when your screw is turned in that direction and Onias has control over you. So demons control people on the planet. So each time period. For example, Moloch. Moloch is the God. You remember we taught you about Moloch and these child molesters. They, they go into the redwoods of California and they offer children to, to the Molech God. I shared that with you. Molech is the God of people born in, in the month of Aries. They, let's read about that. Aries is the ultimate fire sign. You're energetic and you're always looking for something new. That's why Moloch is drawn to your spirit. Like you, Moloch represents the creation of something exciting and the destruction of new life. You, you'll have a crazy amount of power, but it's going to come at a cost. When you find yourself possessed by Moloch, don't be surprised if you develop a healthy appetite for children. After all, the main form of sacrifice to Moloch is to burn a baby in its honor. Now, this is the sign of Aries. So, this is how spirits possess people because they believe in astrolo astrology, the sign of the zodiacs. There are millions like these sort of people in the world. Now, let's look at the testimony of Solomon. Now, Solomon met with Beelzebub. I, Solomon, said unto him, Beelzebub, what is thy employment? And he answered to me, I destroy kings. I bring destruction by means of tyrants. And my own demons I send unto men to be worshipped. In order that the latter may believe in them and be lost. And the chosen servants of God, priests and faithful men, I excite unto desires for wicked sins, evil heresies, and lawless deeds. Who are these people? Chosen servants of God. And they obey me and I will bear them on to destruction. I will inspire men with envy and desire for murder and for wars and sodomy. And other evil things, I will bring about jealousies and murders in a country. And I instigate wars. I will destroy the world. These are the words of Beelzebub, the prince of demons, to Solomon. His plan of action against human beings. I mean, you have to be blind. Not to see how true these words are spoken to Solomon. Right now as we're living... I mean, if you look at this tyrant that wants to control the world, he's a tyrant. He's doing, he's worshipping demons knowingly. That's what uh, Beelzebub told to Solomon. I make tyrants. And then he says, I'll send my own demons upon the men for the men to worship them. And, and they will be, and they will worship them. And they will be destroyed. And they will be misled. And, and the exact words that Beelzebub told to Solomon was, And my own demons I send unto men to be worshipped, in order that the latter, the men, may believe in them and be lost. Now unknowingly, human beings on this planet are worshipping demons, half human, half angels. Now, I don't want to offend anybody, but there's many religious religions that believe in a half human, half animal uh, God, goddesses, you know, Solomon has been told this is what's going to happen. These people unknowingly, unwittingly, without realizing, perhaps they were taught this by growing up in their culture, in their family. 
And so they innocently do this, but what they don't realize is that no matter what they do, their lives are always strangled. Because the person in charge of them is darkness. They screwed into this world and their makaba will never be released until everything inside of them is coming out and they feel lost. Let's look at this. God's chosen servants and priests and faithful men. They will do wicked sins, evil heresy and lawless deeds. Do you know there's many a person who become pastors and they start off very faithful, very sincere, with a pure heart. And as they go along, th th this work that, that we do is very, very challenging. I've been in the secular world. I've worked there. I've worked with people. I've done business. And I can tell you the toughest job, if you're doing it properly, with the greatest amount of faith required, is being a pastor. You have to absorb criticism because not everybody can agree with everything people do, pastors do. And so you have to absorb criticism. You have to absorb people speaking behind your back yet they sit inside your congregation and, and be part of the church. You have to absorb the pressure of working, you know, you have to attend to everybody's spiritual emotional needs every time a pastor gets a phone call it's almost never something good always there's a problem and they need assistance so the weight of carrying the spiritual well, uh, wellness of every person that God gives you if you want to be a faithful man it is a tremendous weight and the more people you carry, the heavier the load becomes on your own person. You have to live by faith because you work every month doing the very best you can do, searching God's heart, counseling, even when I couldn't reach people during the, physically, but emotionally, my prayer life had to carry them. My advice to them has to carry them. You know, we, our, our hands may be short, but our prayer is very powerful. That God is the one that does the miracles. He does the healing. He does everything. He can reach you where you are. But the, the pressure of that, and every month you work for it, and you know what? The, 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 the thing that God has carried us as pastors or me as, as a person for such a long time, every month you work, at the end of every month, you have bills to pay. You have food to put on the table. You have so many expenses that need to be taken care of, including ministry commitments. People depend on you. And that weight sits on your shoulders. And you have to trust God that his servants, imagine if you work the whole month and your boss decides at the end of the month he's not going to give you a salary. And that's the kind of faith we need to have that we can, we can operate and, and do God's work. You cannot compel somebody to honor God. You've got to trust that God will choose his people to sustain you. It's tough. It's very tough. It's even tougher. And the reason is because for me, I, I don't tolerate uh, anyone who, who abuses God, who is vile in any way, who, who does things that I find that, you know, correction is not helping them. And, and so I, I remove people from under my covering. I've done that over the years because I want people to associate with people who can be trusted. And so this is the stance and when you remove people you eliminate the possibility of having 
your salary full at the end of the month because those people now will remove themselves and their substance from and so it's even harder if you want to be pure as a pastor that's what you have to do but you see when people go into the ministry they struggle it's normal and then these pastors now they try to you see the devil wants them to screw into the world so they try to look for other ways to supplement their income they try to manipulate people and when they manipulate they create false heresies this is this is who the devil said he targets chosen servants of god faithful men priests they they look at a ah, little compromise mm, i'm not i'm sure god understands and so slowly and surely the devil turns the macabre his way and they become people who who con people who who manipulate people to the, to give they they start to make um uh, heretic statements so that god can bless the people if they give all these things is done to the pastors the faithful men so listen if you've been faithful maybe god didn't call you to minister that's why it was so difficult but what god does is let me tell you he doesn't make you rich he doesn't give you to indulge more than what you need but he sustains you and that's all you can do just work hard do his work keep his people safe spiritually and every other way you can be honest be faithful and he'll take care of you this is not something you get into to get rich you see once you you give into those slight compromises as a man of god you you become compromised and once you screwed in everybody that sits under you gets screwed that's why bilzebub goes after these people he doesn't really target he's big he doesn't target the small ones he goes for the big ones and he screws them in and i'm not talking about the big preachers the ones that already he he owns i'm talking about the little faithful ones the ones that are faithful start of faithful he wants to get them and so he cripples them and god puts you through a ringer puts you through a test to see whether you're going to compromise your standard and he's done that to us whether we're going to compromise our standard and i totally refused i tell the story sometimes once upon a time i shared with you we were in this tent and the tent was taken away we couldn't pay our rent things were very tough and one of my faithful members knew the struggles we were going through and he was a security uh, person somewhere and he was chasing some criminal who dropped a bag of half a million dollars and he had that bag the police didn't find it because he dropped it this criminal dropped it on the way and and the security person brought it as a member of our church he says pastor things are very difficult i found half a million rand here and maybe you can use it how half a million dollars that's in rands that that's like 10 times that amount and he says you can use it and we can you know we can be comfortable and i looked at it and something in me told me this is a setup because i could see the devil wanted and at that time i didn't know much about the macaba the principle but i can tell you he wanted to entrap me and so i didn't even pray about it i told the person same place same time take this loot and give it to the police station let them deal with it i don't know what happened to the but the, the young man did that and that's why i know the trap this is filthy money this is money not earned and you'll find that that's what happens to the normal people the normal pastors the ones that are faithful this is how he traps god's chosen god's chosen servants that's what the devil wants to do screw them into the world you may not know this but some of these people who started off innocent they became big renowned pastors there's articles that tell you three pastors charged with sex trafficking of our children in ohio Eastern Cape Church founder faces charges of sexual assault human trafficking alleged sex trafficking pastor in South Africa illegally pastor arrested with drugs en route Kenya for crusade South African police shut churches for drug and human trafficking the article tells us in the guardian 
South African police have shut down some churches in Hillbrow and Yeovil found to be involved with drug peddling and human trafficking. Over 20 churches in Johannesburg were raided by Johannesburg Metro Police while 10 of them have been shut down. Another article tells us, Holy Rollers, headline, the religious leaders use churches to launder illicit cash across the Americas. When Eric Sonega died in U.S. custody in April, he left a rich religious and political legacy in the Guatemalan town where he founded an evangelical church and served as mayor for over a decade. He also left behind a property empire that was most likely built with drug money. Some of that cash appears to have been laundered through his religious and political network. The investigation continues. Paradise of money and faith. That is one of the findings of a cross-border investigation by 12 media organizations from nine countries coordinated by Colombian Journalism Investigations and Latin American Center for Investigative Journalism. OCC PR's regional partner in Latin America into church-related money laundering across the Americas. The phenomenon is widespread as religious organizations often escape scrutiny due to their respected role within communities and the lack of regulation governing the affairs experts say. In a number of countries, this includes tax exemptions. Over the years, religious institutions have been repeatedly used to launder money, said Mark Califano, a former U assistant U.S. attorney and chief legal officer at Nadello and Company, a global investigative firm. And their special and protective place in most countries and societies has allowed that to happen. I want you to see the reality. You know the preachers that you see and you know by name, the big ones, etc. Do you know how many of them are involved with human trafficking, with, um, with illicit drugs? They import it, house it in their places of worship, launder the money, sell it and push it in the church and that's how the money gets laundered. Some of the churches don't do it but what they use, they use their, their church platform a pastor is contacted by some drug lord and they say, we're going to put some monies in your account to clean it up. You give us so much and you take 10%. Lots of these people operate. You won't know it, you won't see it. But that's how it operates. And that's what the devil said I'm going to do. I'm going to get inside there. People who are faithful, now they're struggling and they have no option. Sometimes they turn to that. And you find that the devil is targeting many, many places. You'll be amazed. Sometimes you think it's only those big people. No, it's going on under your nose. And what you don't realize is that the people who go there are sitting under that spell. And so every time these people speak from the pulpit, it has to do with worldly things. They screw you deeper into the world. Give so that you can be blessed. Give so that your body can be blessed. Come and do this so that that can be blessed. You get blessed a new car, you're going to be blessed. He says, God will provide for you. You don't have to pray for anything. You don't have to go and give money for anything. God will provide. If you are faithful, God will provide. The devil told Solomon, evil heresy. He wants to create people to make evil heretic statements and beliefs so that he can indoctrinate people that follow him. And I shared with you about what Joel Olstein done last week. He took several books out of the New Testament, all the writings of Paul, Romans 1 and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians 1 and 2 Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Timothy, Titus, Philemon and Hebrews. All these scriptures are out. And he put in, in its place his own book, the writings from his book. Your better life. Now all his congregation is going, you know part of uh, the, the rapture now is written in Corinthians uh, and Thessalonians rather, the one I shared with you in the beginning. Do you know his congregation, if they come and join their church now and they're not Christians and they haven't read this Bible before, they won't know anything about the rapture because it removed Paul's writings. That's evil heresy. 1 Thessalonians 4, 7. Then he who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and thus we shall always be with the Lord. This is the rapture. The devil does not want people to prepare for the rapture so he gives them false heresy. Some of the preachers want you only to build your kingdom here. Everything you do must build your own kingdom. 
better house, better car, better job. Only improve yourself here. There's no impact on your spirit. You'll find some of them never talk of anything. That's why they remove Paul. And lots of them do that. They remove Paul's teaching completely. They only talk of the prosperity things. 1 Timothy 5.22. Another heretic teaching that people don't adhere to. Listen, this is what Paul tells us. Do not lay hands on anyone hastily. Nor share in other people's sins. Do you know? The preachers. Anybody and everybody. Lay hands. Put the sand altar. One, two, three. No... There's no consideration about the scripture. Why did Paul tell us that? It's, it's, it, it, they force people to form a doctrine in their own heart. That when they come to church, unless they come in the front and they get hands laid on, it's not church. They feel they're not satisfied. So that ritual becomes, this is heresy. Because it's not according to what Paul says. Anything that is not according to doctrine of Paul that wrote and appeared in our scriptures is heresy. It means it's not the original. And you find that these people, Paul never blew anybody down. They want to blow people in the 15th row down. And if they don't fall when they come in front, they push them down. Must collapse. Then, then that's anointing now. The, all these things. That these people are doing is heretical. Who made them do that? Who inspired them? If you look, want to know more about that, go to a, one of my sermons, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit is not a drunken spirit. Learn about that. It's very important. These are heretical things. They make people drunk, roll around, laugh. They are humiliating themselves. And it's a, it's a new teaching apparently. God is doing a new thing. Anything new apart from what he told us is heresy. And there are thousands of pastors practicing heresy. And now when you stand on the pulpit and you talk to those congregation people sitting, you are turning that screw further into darkness. That's why when these people who sit there, they have dreams because they got a macabre. They are able to go into a different realm when they sleep. And they have bad nightmarish dreams in that realm. Because it's a sign that you are possessed. All nightmares means that you've entered that realm. You've done something. That's why Jesus says if you're angry, you know, calm down. Put yourself right before you close your eyes. Because you'll enter that realm when you sleep. If you screwed on too tight. You sleep with too much anger, too much worry, you'll screw yourself in. And when you sleep, that macabre of yours that you are built in walking will enter that world, that wrong world. And that's why you purify yourself every day and say, Lord, whatever happened today, it is of this world. I don't want it to impact the way I sleep. And you clean yourself. Lord, help me. This is hard to do, but help me, Father. And when you go to bed, your macabre can take you to have pleasant dreams. Those of you that can remember. But sometimes, God, once in a while, God gives you some horrific dreams because he wants to warn you. It's a different thing altogether. Dreams is too deep to get into now. But I'm just giving you an idea. Listen, there are hungry people. People who are desperate for the Lord. Desperate to get a better life. Desperate for help. And these false heresy preachers, these are the people who are positioned in place to take advantage of you. Never compromise. That's why when I want to help people, I first have to open their minds, reshape them with everything I teach, what I wrote in my book, reshape their mind so that when, when I'm ready to assist, they already have, some of them don't need to come back to me for assistance because once their mind is reshaped, those spirits got no place in them. Most of the people who are faithful, who listen to what I tell them to do, who hear my sermons, who follow and put in practice. You find that if they start off possessed, they come with problems, bad dreams, things are not working. You find that without even praying or laying hands on them, they turn their life around. And that's because the mind has shifted. So this morning, I want you to take stock of everything you are. 
Check. Look in the mirror and check. Do I have anything in me that screws me into this world? And then make a decision. I'm going to turn. I'm going to get close to you, Lord. And I'm going to unscrew. So when Jesus comes with that trumpet, I am. There's no way I'm remaining behind. Be determined. Light your candle and keep it burning. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I ask you to touch every child that's hearing. I pray, Lord, that whom Jesus Christ has set free will be free indeed. That nobody that is called by his name will get engaged in this world so much so that it will poison their soul. It will poison their spirits. It will prevent them from rising. This morning, Lord, I take my time to reach out to you to touch the hearts of every listener that after this day they will not be the same person tomorrow their lives will change instantly separate them from this world in Jesus name I pray Amen Beloved God bless you remember the whirlwind turns in one way the whirlwind turns the other way. You yourself are responsible for whether you go up or you stay here. God bless you. Have a beautiful week. I pray you will see me next week.